Jeremy, we appreciate your your time um, this Friday afternoon. Can you uh, let everyone know what your role is and what organization you work for? Yeah, I'm with the Texas Homeschool Coalition. My name is Jeremy Newman, and I'm the deputy director there. So uh, one of the things that I manage is pretty much all of our policy work, litigation work, legislative work. So, uh, you know, of course, that happens during the five month legislative session, but then kind of the next year and a half that gets into political campaigns and uh, kind of research oriented stuff, too. How long have you been with the group? Almost 10 years. Oh, wow. Were you homeschooled yourself? I was. Yep. Yeah. One of six. So is this why you wanted to move in that direction? It was a combination of that and I think just a natural interest I had in law and politics growing up. I, I grew up in the debate, speech and debate community, so there was a natural transition there. Oh, very nice. There, when you were growing up and, um, and us, like the homeschool kids were always outcast kids. Do you still see that today? Are the homeschool kids kind of like outcast kids and kind of get left behind a little bit? Not left behind, but kind of shunned by other students? Yeah, I know what you mean. I... I don't perceive it that way. I actually, I didn't perceive it that way very much growing up because we had a big community of other homeschool families that we were connected with. I remember, there's only one time I remember growing up where I met someone, um, I was pretty young, I can't even remember exactly how old, but I met someone and they were talking about school and I mentioned to them that they were, I was homeschooled and they said, what is that? I don't understand what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll have to educate you a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, normally the homeschool kids are always way smarter than the, the kids <laughs> yeah. in public school, and uh, but, but oftentimes they just kind of take on all the beliefs, uh, which I think they would anyways, of their parents. So like anything their parents believe, they would they would and they would speak with adults all day. So they talk more like an adult than a kid. Do you, you kind of agree with that as well? Oh yeah, and that that's actually research based too. That you know they've studied this. There are ways that you can kind of quantify um, whether or not a, a homeschool graduate, first of all, retains the values of their parents, which homeschoolers do at a higher rate than other students do. And then second of all, how involved they are in their community, they use that to measure whether the child was socialized well or not. And homeschoolers outperform on that metric too. So I've always perceived that when, when people say, you know, they ask this question of, you know, are homeschoolers well socialized or they imply that they're not, to me, that means like you have a very narrow definition of what it means to be socialized, right? It's like, it means sticking around people your own age all day, every day in the public school. Yeah. So where does that come from? Can we talk about that? Like the socialization of it. There's that, that stigma by a lot of us that are, that send our kids to public schools that, you know, I, I guess it goes along the same message of, of the, of the homeschool kids being outcast, but also they're, they're missing out on collaborating with kids, their own age and stuff. So, I mean, from a research perspective, is, is that true or, can it be debunked? Yeah. So from, from a research perspective, I'll say two things. First of all, it is really important for kids to be socialized, right? Like just developmentally, it's essential. But the second thing is you have to then talk about what it means to be socialized, right? And, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, that when they study this, they measure that typically by things like how involved are you in your community? How uh, tolerant are you of other political beliefs or cultural beliefs or religious beliefs? How likely are you to vote? And you know, all those types of things. Homeschoolers are more likely to be involved positively in all of those things than other students are. And uh, to me, one of the reasons for that is that the, the model that we have for socialization in the public school does not apply anywhere else in our culture. There is nowhere else in our culture you will ever go to where you only talk to people your own age. Right. And so it's not like that in homeschooling. It's a much broader spread. And you might not think that's a big issue until you realize that one of the things that helps socialize a child is by being around people who are more mature than them, right? So that they understand how to relate to that person and then how to model that person to some degree. And I just don't think we have that set up very well in the public school system. That's what? a good point. I never thought that there's <laughs> never a setting where you're just going to talk to all, all people of your same age. Yeah. Mm, what were you going to say? I was going to say, um, does it, it, it like, what are some ways that kids that are homeschooled, like that get socialized in, in other settings that are just outside of their parents? Because I know there's programs that mm -hmm. get the kids involved and there's like homeschool pods. I don't know what the right term is, but there's like homeschool pods where the kids can come together and, and, and learn like that. But what are some other ways that kids get 
um, socialize while they're being homeschooled? Yeah, so there are a few big ways. So one of them obviously is things like homeschool co-ops, which is like for, for the outside observer, it you would think it might be almost a traditional private school, the way that it looks from the outside. In reality, it's usually like one or two days a week that where students will come in to some physical location, often a church, and the parents will be pooling resources to help teach each other's kids on different subjects. So, you know, a parent enrolls their students in this co-op and they agree to teach two classes during the semester or something like that. And the, it's, it's, not, it's not rigidly grade-based like it is in the public school system, right? So you have older students and younger students that mix a fair amount in those different class, classroom settings. And outside the traditional co-op, then obviously you have extracurricular activities. That was one of the big things for us when I was growing up was the speech and debate world. And that's a pretty big thing in the homeschool community is speech and debate. And there's a huge mix of ages and, and maturity levels that go together in those competitions as well. And um, then, I mean, there's some of the normal activities that a lot of people socialize through. So like church was a big thing for us and the whole community that came around that. And a lot of families do it this way where we were involved in a church where a lot of the families were also homeschooling. So we, we were connected with a lot of the same people in multiple places. That's very interesting. How do y'all deal with like, I, I know this isn't critical, but how do y'all deal with sports and things like team building and things like that? Do y'all have that a segment of that as well? Yeah. So that's interesting. So there's, there are a couple different things. So, um, there are a lot of, a lot of pickup sports take place in the homeschool community, right? Um, in terms of more organized sports, those exist for sure. There are a lot of extracurricular programs. We actually though passed a bill on this during the last legislative session, because one of the problems that does exist in homeschooling is in the, in the rural communities, depending on the type of activity you want, you might not physically have enough homeschoolers who are interested in that subject to put together, you know, a baseball team or a football team or something like that. And so that's, there's an opportunity issue there where some people will drive three, four hours, one direction to get to the closest opportunity. And then when you live in the metropolitan areas, they're really expensive and people don't think about it this way, but homeschool families are already paying for the public school system, right? That's where all their tax dollars go to. Then they have to pay a second time to educate their own children. And when the activities are prohibitively expensive, then it's just, it is kind of a barrier to opportunity. So we passed the bill in the last session that allows public school districts to grant access for homeschoolers to come in and participate in UIL activities in the public school. And most other states do it that way, but Texas has been, it's taken a long time <laughs> for Texas to get there. Oh, that's really cool. I, th- that was going to be my next question. So someone who's homeschooled can go potentially play football somewhere in Texas as well, or ba- or baseball or basketball. Yeah. So right now there are somewhere in the neighborhood of three dozen schools or school districts in Texas that allow that. And the way the bill is drafted, each school district can opt in or opt out to that program. But the answer is yes, that that is possible. Wow. This is for public schools? Or yeah, colleges? public schools that agree to allow homeschoolers in to participate in public uh, school UIL activities. Th- this might be a broad question, but I, what are some of the main differences that Texas has compared to other states when it comes to rules and, and stipulations for homeschooling kids? Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, big picture, first point would be Texas is one of the most free states in the country. So there are five to seven, depending on how you count them, that are pretty similar. Texas uh, ranks up there for sure in one of the most free states. We're also one of the biggest, right? So combined, that means we have one of the biggest homeschool populations in the country. And so one thing that Texas does that some states do, but a lot don't is homeschool co-ops, like I mentioned before. And it's because in Texas, you can kind of envision it this way that you can think of a very traditional brick and mortar private school on one end of the spectrum. And on the other end, you can think of super traditional homeschool. Literally everything is taught by the parent in the home, in the living room, that type of thing. Right. Well, now imagine a spectrum between those. Everything in between exists in Texas. And so um, homeschoolers will do this thing where, you know, they take some classes in the home, they'll take some classes online, they'll take some classes in what you refer to as a homeschool pod, which is, you know, a handful of families together in someone's home. Some of them are in a more traditional homeschool co-op. There's a big mix. Um, in fact, I w- I've, I've joked before with people that the only consistent thing about how homeschooling is done is that it's diverse. Mm. And so... It's a, it's a really interesting place to be because it gives a tremendous amount of control to parents. And that's one of the things that's attractive about it. In other states, in some other states, uh, it's much more restrictive. 
So it'll be things like maybe the parent has to have, you know, teacher certification to be allowed to teach at all. Maybe you have to get approval from the school district on your curriculum plan. Maybe you even have to get periodic reviews of the student's work from the school district. Uh, it, some of it gets pretty rigid. One thing that's really fascinating, though, is that if you if you take all of these regulations across the country and then you plot student academic success across and overlay it on top of that, you'll see that the level of regulation has zero correlation to the level of academic success for the student. So you hike up regulations and it gives absolutely no better academic outcomes for the students. Mm. You seem like a metrics person from the uh, talks we've had so far. How do you? Uh, I, I have that, yeah, I have <laughs> that predisposition for sure. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a good thing in this in this day day and age. Um, how do the homeschoolers stack up against the um, community uh, public school public school uh, students uh, when when testing into college? Okay, yeah. So if you if you're measuring it with nationally norm standardized tests, which is the typical metric, then at as a system, homeschoolers outperform every other form of education by a significant margin. So um, public school students statistically kind of define the average at about 50 percent. And, and to be clear, what that means is these are nationally normed tests. So it's not saying you got X number of questions right out of X number, it's saying you performed better than this percentage of students who also took the same test. So public schoolers typically pretty much define the average at about 50 percent. Right. Uh, traditional or charter schools outperform public schools, private schools outperform charter schools, homeschoolers outperform private schools. And so homeschoolers th will perform on average about 25 to 35 percentile points above their public school peers. So the average home average public school student will score 50 out of 100 on you know, ranked against other students. Average homeschooler student will perform 75 to 85 out of 100. And the thing that's really fascinating is in Texas, we spend over $10,000 per student per year to accomplish that for public schools. <laughs> the average homeschooled parent spends $500 or less per student per year to accomplish that. Man, I got a bunch of metrics questions now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so what do you, I don't know if you know, but what percentage of homeschooled kids, their parents are, were homeschooled? Is that a high number typically? <laughs> Um, I don't know that exact number. The, the related number I can tell you is that, or trend, is that it, I think it's seven out of 10, if I remember correctly, it's the vast majority of students who were homeschooled say they will plan to homeschool their own students. Mm -hmm. So the majority of growth statistically that you'd normally see in the homeschool community is from families who are choosing to continue homeschooling generation, generationally. And then the smaller percentage of growth is people coming in from the outside. But that, you know, with COVID especially, that became a big thing. That'd be funny to do. I, I don't think they have this, this statistic, but seeing how much smarter parents get compared to public school parents. Because <laughs> you got to get okay. smarter when you, I, mean, I don't know, public school, you have to get smart too. You have to help Not, the kids I mean, with the test and the homework. A and little bit, yeah. You got to get back into it, definitely. You just yeah. can't not know. Okay. But. but here's, here's something that's fascinating. This is really counterintuitive that for homeschool parents, whether you have a GED, so you didn't, you know, you never finished high school or a PhD, right? These two different extremes has virtually no impact on the academic outcomes for the student. So a PhD academic professor homeschools their kids and a high school dropout homeschools their kids statistically their kids will perform at almost the exact same academic success rate. Wow. And so the point I make to people from that is what that tells me is that the job of a homeschool parent is not to have all the knowledge in their head and to transfer knowledge from their head to their student's head. The thing that makes it successful is creating a good learning environment for the student. And you can do that even if you don't have a PhD. So let's get into that. As I understand it, there's not like one set of curriculum that, um, kids in, in Texas have to follow if they're homeschooled. There's like a bunch of different programs. So how does a parent like, like I'm, I have kids in school and I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely interested and in, I want to homeschool my kids, yeah. but there's just, there's so much information. I don't even know where to start. So what, if a yeah. parent is interested and they want to take their kids out of public school, how do they get started? Cause there's so many other programs to pick from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a couple answers. So one of the first interesting things is this is the opposite problem from what everyone had 30 years ago, right? Where there were almost no curriculum options. 
now there are so many options that people feel intimidated to start. And um, so if you're in the public school system right now, the very first thing you have to do, legally speaking, is to go through the disenrollment process. You have to, that's true whether it's in semester or out of semester. You have to go through the disenrollment process if you're already in public school. Once you do that, the legal requirements in Texas say that you have to teach a program that over the course of the whole program will cover the subjects of reading, spelling, grammar, math, and a study of good citizenship, which is that last one is basically civics. And so those are pretty loose requirements, right? Like most educational programs will just naturally cover that. So then you get into this market-based question of what are all the options? How do I find them? Um, statistically, the average homeschool parent will pull curriculum options from a bunch of different places, and they will also do it differently for every student. And so here's the first thing that I normally tell parents when they're trying to figure out how to get started is the very first thing to realize is get rid of this idea that you have to replicate public school in your homeschool. It doesn't work like that at all. So you're not going to spend eight hours a day doing instruction for your kid because you don't have 40 kids in your class, right? You have two or three. And so um, the average homeschool student will spend a few hours. Like when, you know, when I was homeschooled, if we got up early, we would be done with school well before lunch. Wow, right. And right. it's because, and here's the other thing is that once we learned to read comprehensively, we more or less did our own school and my parents were there for questions, but they weren't the ones like sitting over your shoulder, driving the whole thing. And so what I tell parents is don't feel like you have to start out with a 10 year plan or even a five year plan, even a two year plan, really. Like it's okay if you have a plan like that, but realize you will not follow it because the whole purpose here is that you're going to learn as you go for what's best for your family, what's best for your student. And it's going to be different based on each student. And so you'll even go at different paces and different subjects. And it's okay to feel that out as you go to a large degree because if, if you kind of thoughtfully experiment with your kid, meaning like you're intentional about it, but you're willing to experiment, you are not going to break your child, right? That you're what you're going to do instead. And this is what I mean by creating a good learning environment with the statistics we talked about earlier. What you'll do instead is discover they do better in these subjects or they do better learning in these ways. So we'll lean into that and they're going to go faster in those subjects and in those areas. And these other ones are harder for them. And so we're going to figure out to pull other resources to help with that. You're going to end up tailoring it a lot and it's okay to tailor it a lot. But one of the things that means is that you have some freedom to not feel like you have to create a rigid plan to start with and know all of it up front, mm. right? So start with a few things that you're going to do, maybe a plan for the year, plan, expect to be flexible with it, and then you'll kind of build it as you go. And that is actually how it's supposed to be done. What do parents do what? whenever the program gets to, I don't know, like, like algebra or calculus and the parents don't really know it. The kids obviously don't know it. So who helps them? Like, how do they learn that material? Yeah. So there are a few, a few different options. So um, one of them is frankly the one I mentioned before, which is that, you know, when I was growing up, once we could read comprehensively, we mostly did it ourselves. And so um, this is interesting that I mentioned before how homeschoolers outperform other students statistically, right? Well, the, that's the differential is highest in STEM fields, especially math. And I don't know exactly how to explain that or why that would be the case, but it seems to be the case, right? So a lot of homeschoolers, you know, I don't want to generalize too much, but a lot of homeschoolers spend more time in math, right? Because for some reason, something about the homeschool environment just makes that one easier to learn. That is definitely not true for everyone, but compared to other subjects, it's, it seems to be the case. And then, um, if you get to a point where the student needs instruction on something that the parent doesn't know, this is where you start pulling from outside resources. So online curriculums, a lot of people, especially in Texas, will do dual credit with their local community college and then homeschool co-ops. So we actually did this when I was growing up. We, um, one of the last few years of high school, the, the high school level math course was something that we did with a homeschool dad who was actually an expert in mathematics. And he taught the high school level course as uh, it was actually a college level course, but it was for high school. And he taught everybody how to do uh, what's called a CLEP test, right? Where you can test out of the subject and you get earned college level credit for it. And so simultaneously, you accomplish a couple different things. First, you outsource to somebody else who's an expert in this field. And then um, you can do it at a community based level, right? So the parent doesn't have to know it all. And then you get college credit for it at the same time. So that was that was the option that worked for us. A lot of people will do online courses or something like that. 
But then you have to also not discount the idea that sometimes, in fact, frequently, the student will just be better in a certain in some certain subject than their parent was. And they might not need as much help as you think they will. Some of them definitely will. But a lot of times, like the student will teach themselves if the environment is good enough. Is there any is there any proctoring needing to happen in this process where your education is validated, you know, so you're not cheating or anything like to, to get past all these levels, especially with like the college credits. Right. So um, anything where the credit is awarded by an outside institution is usually going to be proctored in some way. So like the college credits that I just mentioned, yeah, that's a, that's a nationally normed standard um, that they create. And you're taking a test usually in a college, you go into the college to take the test along with other people. Um, but that's all, that's not necessarily the norm, right? So if, if you're just talking about homeschooling generally, then no, there's not any type of outside uh, review or anything like that that's done. But what's interesting is that if we go back to the prior point that I made, the only reason that you would do that is if you thought it was going to increase academic outcomes for the student. But it turns out it doesn't, right? If you look in all of the states where they are more rigid like that, it doesn't actually improve academic outcomes at all. And my theory on that is that it's because the learning environment was the thing that accomplished the goal to begin with, right? It wasn't the rigid academics. And so the, in these environments where you have someone from the outside coming in to verify all of the student grades or something, it might be the case that you'll, that you'll catch some people who otherwise would have been kind of bottom of the barrel in their academic experience and you'll help lift them up, maybe. But if that's true, it's not enough for you to see it in the numbers, right? Because it doesn't raise the overall averages for academic performance for homeschoolers. What are some black boxes with homeschooling? What is like a couple of key areas that, that need to be fixed within the state of Texas and, and what the, your, your organization is working on? Okay. Yeah. So I'll list a couple and I'll say first, not all of these things need to be fixed by the state necessarily. Right. Um, there are, there's some things that the state can do, but one of the biggest things, in fact, maybe the biggest thing is I mentioned before that homeschooling, you know, homeschoolers spend about $500 per student per year, right? Well, that's out of pocket cost, but also usually one of the parents had to either scale back or completely quit a job in order to accomplish that. So there are these soft costs that come with it too. And so, you know, a lot of families who do it are, you know, you don't have to be rich to homeschool. Right. But it's definitely the case that there's a big financial barrier to some people. So one of the things that we've worked on is how do you set up the system so that the parent is not paying twice? They pay all this money to the public school system through their taxes, and then they have to go pay again to educate their own students. So things like tax credits uh, are an idea that are popular. And then some things like education savings accounts, where the state will take a portion of the money that was allocated for your student at the public school but instead of sending it to the public school, they put it in an account and you can use it for your own student. So uh, those are some things that I would mention on the, on the, the um, financial side. Are y'all making, and then, I don't mean to interrupt. Say it again. I said, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I guess I kind of did. <laughs> are y'all making any, <laughs> any headway on that stuff? Because that, I mean, taxes, you know, here in our area is like seven, $8,000 a year for, for parents. Um, so yeah. is there any headway uh, being made with that? There definitely is. So post COVID, especially there's kind of this big wave of, uh, I would call it just kind of a demand, frankly, from parents that there'd be more options available in education, hybrid options, and that they weren't, they were not comfortable with these rigid buckets that they had to choose between for education options for their students. So what that has done is it's created an overall appetite. And this is interesting that the, I think it was the Dallas morning news that just pulled this recently among every ethnic demographic and every political demographic that they polled, there was a majority of all of them that said that they wanted a system where money followed the child. Mm. And so that's, you know, it hasn't always been that way. Right. And traditionally it's on the more liberal side, but even more than that, like the public education side, where it's kind of the institutionalized interest there, those are the people who have traditionally opposed it the most because the way they see it is, if you take, if you give money to the child, you're taking it from the public school. Now we don't have to get into the public school funding debate, but the big purpose there is my, my baseline point to everyone is what is the purpose of education, right? Is it for the school or is it for the child? And, you know, as soon as you answer that question, most other things become a lot more clear. 
So yeah, there's there's definitely a much bigger appetite in Texas. It'll be worked on for sure this coming session, probably in a bunch of different forms. I would say it's probably ha has the best chance of passing this coming legislative session compared to what it's ever had, but it's not a slam dunk for sure. You know, public school funding is, is pretty insane. You go by some of these schools, they got like collegiate level stadium, football stadiums out there, especially in Texas. I mean, we're the cream of the crop. Um, mm -hmm. Dripping Springs where I grew up, it seems like there's two high schools now. They got AstroTurf. They got big uh, screens on, and that's where all the money's going, right? I mean, it's going to these outrageous uh, sporting programs. I'm sure that burns a fire underneath you and your, your coworkers. It definitely does. So this is something else that's interesting. Um, you, I, I can't give you all the details of this. I just remember the high level point that within the last couple sessions, one of the bills that they passed to increase public funding, they had to earmark how many dollars were going to go directly to the teachers. And the reason they had to do that is because in the past, when they give public funding, when they increase public funding, the dollars never make it to the teachers. They go to all of these other places. Right. And so I think here, here's kind of the way I think of it is like, um, it seems to me that one of the big problems that we have in Texas is that we have great students and great teachers who are bundled together in a system that doesn't let them teach and doesn't let them learn well. And there's a degree to which you can't totally avoid that when you have a huge system because the bigger it gets, the more rigid it has to get to survive, right? And so you have to accept that cost at some level. But then also you have to realize, like, when does it reach the point where you've lost the purpose of the entire system, right? And and to me, I think if, if you put a lot more control in the hands of teachers and students, you get a lot better outcomes. Since COVID, have you have y'all seen uh, a, a big wave of, of teachers leaving the public school system and starting like their own pod or their own homeschool network? Yeah. So uh, there definitely have been some, I, the data doesn't really exist to be able to track very well how many people who are starting pods and stuff like that came from the public school system, but you can track it on the other end, right? There was a survey that was done within the last month or two of public school teachers. And I think it was over 70% of Texas public school teachers who said that they were considering quitting their job. Mm. Right. That's like existential crisis level issue. Right. right. Seventy percent of people walk away. The system stops completely. And I think part of it is this. We, we've put teachers in this position now where we don't expect them to just be teachers. Right. We expect them to do everything for these students and not just for the students, but for like 40 students at a time. Right. You're parenting 40 students at a time. And not only is it not possible for the teachers it wasn't their job to begin with and it's not fair and it's not going to be effective because the, you, then you think on the other end of the spectrum, right? Where parents have, and they should have, right? The ability to have a lot of control over their child. But what that means is you get together 40 students from different families and give them one parent you know, for most of the day, you're going to have a lot of disagreement between the parents of the actual students over how that teacher is doing. So it puts a ton of pressure on that one teacher. I just think that, it's a, it is a systemic issue, right? The way that we've created education where I, I just think it's almost impossible for a good teacher to ach accomplish a good result. And it's not actually impossible, right? Some people manage to do it, but especially to do it and then replicate it over time. Well, really, really difficult. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I was thinking of what, if I were, I were a homeschooler, what would I miss out on? And I started thinking probably the opposite sex, like, the ability to date while you're in school and talk to girls or talk to boys, whatever, whatever you're into. But what do you, what do you say about that being yourself a homeschooler? Did you feel like you missed out on that part of school of uh, public school? Um, I did not. So I think that there are a couple of different answers. So one of them is in the homeschool community, it's, it's less so now than it used to be, but it's still the case that it is primarily people who are religiously or morally motivated, right? So that actually informs quite a bit how they view things like the dating culture. Um, I don't even agree with all of it, right, how it's been done in the homeschool community in the past, but it does definitely have the effect that if you pick the average homeschool student compared to the average public school student, their dating experience will be different and it's not primarily a level uh, like an access issue that was a weird word to choose there but opportunity right <laughs> um, it's not primarily based off of opportunity it's uh, a lot of it is culture 
right, of what people prefer and don't prefer. So um, I didn't feel like I really missed out on that. It's certainly not like, you know, sex segregated or something like that in the homeschool community where you don't actually physically have the opportunity. I would say that there are parts of that culture in the homeschool community that I did not think were healthy, but I think overall it is far more healthy than the culture that you have in the average public school where it's at this point, it's almost like anything goes. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. No disagreement. Um, what about, have y'all thought about furthering this even to the college level? Um, because you know, most people graduate like 23, if just staying on that path and getting their, I don't know if that exists either. Uh, like continuing to get their bachelor's or master's degree with their, with their parents. Is that, is that far fetched or oh, you, been talked well, about? Do you mean like they can actually get their college education from their parent? Yes. So no, that, that doesn't exist. Not in the technical sense, just because, I mean, that's, and it's an accreditation issue, right? Like I suppose that your parents could create an unaccredited college and give you a degree, but nobody would recognize it. Right? And so, well, I just, um, I, I, I say that because there's a lot of wasted time in college too. Oh, tons of like it. Even online, tons. we're, we're going yeah. online and we're like, we could probably finish this quicker if we just got to the point, but we're spending a lot of money and time. And I feel like that's probably an opportunity too, if it's possible. So, yeah, I think the way homeschoolers have approached that is they do a lot of them do college differently than the average person, right? So one of them is that a lot of homeschoolers do dual credit. And so it's not horribly uncommon for homeschoolers to graduate high school with an associate's degree or even a bachelor's degree. That's not the standard, right? It's not like homeschoolers are all brilliant or something, but <laughs> it's a lot more common for sure than among public schoolers, just because it's set up in a way where you can be that flexible. You can say, Hey, here's the last half of high school. I'm just going to have you start college early. And you can do that, right? And you still do it through a college institution, but it's really, it's a lot harder to do that in the traditional public school, especially because you're eight hours a day spent studying, right? As a 15 year old, right? It's, it's hard to be, it's hard to have academic aspirations beyond what's right in front of you because you're just drowning in it. So homeschoolers often do college differently. There are even college level programs now that I don't think they were built for homeschoolers necessarily, but homeschoolers use them a lot, like uh, Texas A&M Commerce has this program called it's a degree in organizational leadership i think is what they call it but it's competency based and so what that means is that you can get in there and they have seven week semesters you can pile on as many courses as you want and as soon as you test out of the subject you're done you get the credits for it and you, and so um the average amount of time that people spend in that program is about two years for a bachelor's degree instead of four and so I've, you know, I've actually known quite a few homeschoolers who did that and they did it as their last two years of high school. So they graduated high school with a bachelor's degree. Wow. I feel like I've missed out totally. Like these, <laughs> these done, done by lunch crap. Like I was in school for a long time. Like, I, <laughs> I get home and get to play for a couple hours before it got dark. It's like, it's a whole, and then you're learning more. I mean, y'all are performing better too. It's like. Can Which, you, yeah. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I definitely would say it is, it's certainly my, my opinion that as a model, homeschooling is the best model compared to all of the others. I don't want to create this rosy picture that makes people think though, like, Hey, there are never any obstacles in homeschooling. It's definitely hard. And, and the way I prefer to tell laid out for people is that it's not that homeschooling isn't hard. It's definitely very hard. It's just a different type of hard than you're going to experience in the public school system. And so in public school, you have to build your whole life around that schedule. That's really difficult, right? It's very rigid. And in homeschooling, like if we wanted to take a day off in the middle of the school year, we could because we also worked through the summer because we were bored in the summer if we weren't doing something. And it just gave us a lot of flexibility. So the hard thing is that especially for the parents, like this is a full time thing, right? You're parenting your kids full time, right? And that's difficult. And, and sometimes there's a financial strain. The upside is you don't have to deal with all of the difficulties that come from the public school system. So it is not that it isn't hard. It is definitely hard. But what you're doing now is probably also very hard. So you just have to pick which one you want. Have, have you been able to, or seen any studies that have been able to measure the happiness of kids that are homeschooled mm -hmm. compared to public schools? I don't know what that would look like, but and that, yeah. it seems like it's impossible yeah. to measure, but... It seems like, so my daughter, she goes to public school and she's friends with two other girls that are, are homeschooled. And these kids are just, they, they have a different, uh, f 
vibe around them when they come over than than her public school friends do. They're happier. They can hold yeah. conversations better. Has anything? Has any studies been done on anything like that? Yeah. So I'm I'm not aware of any studies that would measure something like it kind of the the amorphous idea of happiness or um, like I don't know what the right word be like the overall well being of the child or yeah something like that. That's I, I'm not aware of a study that measures that. I have to think hard about how you would measure that. Um, I can say anecdotally, right? That my my experience, and of course I have a bias, right? But my experience anecdotally is that. Oftentimes, when I meet someone who was homeschooled, I can figure out that they were homeschooled before they tell me, just from the way that they interact with me. You know, I'm thinking about my my kids' routine. They get up at you know five forty five, six in the morning. They're they're tired. She's always grouchy. She's coming downstairs, and she's always in a bad mood. I imagine being homeschooled. You you can wake up a little bit later and sleep sleep like a kid should probably sleep. Yeah, you can. And so, um, and, and we did that at different times during either the academic year or during our overall academic career. And we did it differently. What's interesting though, is that you can give a level of responsibility to the child there, right? Where, especially when they're younger and they don't, they haven't quite figured out the cost benefit of staying up really late and getting up really early and things like that, then you can just let them sleep in late and you can afford it, right? Because you have enough time in the day to make that work. But what's interesting is that as we got later in our academic career, then we started realizing like, oh, there's a benefit to getting up early, right? Because I can be done by lunch and then I can do what I want with the rest of my day. And the, like you just hand responsibility to the child there. And there's enough margin in the day that you can do that to some degree. These last two years have been insane with COVID and these you know, school shootings and things like that. Have y'all seen a rush of parents leaving public schools and kids leaving public schools and looking for homeschool options? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me set some context here. So um, before COVID hit, homeschooling was already the fastest growing form of education in America. Now, and it had been for a long time. It was still small, but it was the fastest growing. Then COVID hit, right? And in the fall of 2020, homeschool numbers, depends on what study you're looking at, but somewhere between doubled and tripled across the, the whole country and in Texas. And then, so in 2020, if, like, if you were looking at our call and email volume, which is one of the ways that we measure how, many, how much interest there is, at the beginning of the fall school year in 2020, the numbers went through the roof on the number of people calling us asking how to start homeschooling. We thought that was a big deal. Then the fall of 2021 came around and it dwarfed 2020, like not even close. And I, I, I think it was 1,700% higher in 2021 than it was in 2019. And the, uh, I think the reason for that is that there was a big core of people who were trying to stick it out in the public school system during 2020. And then when they got to 21 and realized this COVID thing is still happening, then they were like, I'm done. Right. And so the fall of 2021 came around and a bunch of them came out. So what we're trying to figure out now is how many of those people are going to stay and for how many of them was it temporary? That's really hard to parse. Um, one of the ways that we measure that is from, uh, I get data from the Texas Education Agency that tells me how many people withdrew from the public school in order to homeschool. And then, but it's also, it, the data comes in a year late, right? So the number that the data we just got shows the spring of 2020 to or the fall of 2020 through the spring of 2021. And it shows that there was a 40% increase over the prior year of the number of students leaving the public school in order to homeschool. And what's going to be really interesting is when the data comes out for the 21-22 school year, how many of those people stayed, right, in homeschooling versus went back? And, and it's too anecdotal for me to be able to tell you at that point, uh, at this point, I can say that our perception is that the inc it is still increasing, but we're off the COVID high. So our numbers, the increase is still bigger and faster than it was in 2019, but it's lower than the 2020 and 2021 peak. That's my perception at the moment. I imagine too, with, with parents being able to work from home, it's, it's probably opened the doors and made it a little more realistic to homeschool their kids. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think definitely that it has, especially considering that like during COVID, when you had public school at home, it was eight hours a day on the computer, right? But when you do homeschooling at home, it's a few hours on the day on the computer if you're doing it all online like it's a few hours a day is the point and so um a parent who wants to work remotely 
it's much more feasible for them to do that, especially if you kind of, if your job is flexible enough that you can move your schedule so that you do school with your child either in the morning or in the evening or maybe split. So it's some of both and your work hours are during their play hours, then it's possible for sure. And is your organization like a, a private organization? It, yeah. Nonprofit organization. So do you see way in the future when people stop going to public school and going more to home and then that tax dollar isn't really going towards that initiative. Could you see the government stepping in into this private organization and trying to take some control over, over that? Yeah. So um, two, two answers to that. So the first one would be, there is kind of an ever present threat, right? No, no matter what you do legislatively, there's an ever present threat of the government wanting to come in and regulate what they are, what they don't control yet, right? Which is private education. And there is a strong, um, natural concern about that in the homeschool community because in the 80s in Texas people got put in jail for homeschooling their kids and and people still remember that right so there's a strong natural resistance to anything that would give the government kind of a, a foot in the door so to speak but then you have to think from the opposite perspective and this is the way we think about it is that if we pass a bill that allows tax credits for example for homeschoolers by doing that, we have not created the risk of government regulation. That risk is ever present. And we're going to have to be there to defend against that, whether we have tax credits or not. And if they ever plan to regulate homeschoolers, they're going to have to pass a bill in the House and in the Senate and get it signed by the governor. And they'll have to do that same thing, whether we have tax credits or not. And so we think, look at it and we think we're not going to say that we're going to oppose a good bill now out of fear for a bad bill later, because that that is always the risk. And then you can look at this in terms of data and say, Across the whole country, we have more than 30, yeah, more than 30 states now with some type of school choice program, more than 64 programs in more than 30 states. There has not been a single one of them in the last, you know, in decades since these existed where the program created or led to government regulation of homeschooling. And so I hear from homeschoolers sometimes who have this concern strong enough that they would oppose the bill if it were filed in Texas. And what I say to them is, your argument here is essentially that you don't want your neighbor to have the choice to participate in this voluntary program because you fear that it might affect your freedom someday. But that's never happened to anyone anywhere in the country. And you need more than that if you're going to claim that you should be able to control your neighbor's decision. Mm. In Texas, which party is more supportive to the homeschool community? Or is it is it kind of a split? So... Uh, I, I mean, definitely, I would say the Republican Party, but we have really strong working relationships with a lot of people in the Democratic Party. So um, maybe this is what I would say. You are more likely to find someone in the D Democratic Party who's antagonistic towards homeschooling than in the Republican Party. But there's still a ton of supporters in the Democratic Party. So here's a good example. Last legislative session, we passed that bill for UIL access that I mentioned. When it got to the House floor, it was not a partisan split. It was not even close. The way I tell, describe it to people is it was an establishment versus anti-establishment split. So you had all of the really progressive Democrats who were voting in favor of the bill and all the conservative Republicans, and then all of the moderates on the Republican side and the Democratic side voted against it. So we had approximately 50% of Democrats and 50% of Republicans who voted in favor of the bill. And it was a really weird mixture, right? So you had really crazy far left Democrats who are like really progressive on a lot of different issues that just culturally we wouldn't agree with, but they were up there on the floor defending our bill, right. And defending the, the choice for homeschoolers to be able to do this. And then you had really far right conservative Republicans doing the same thing. And they were standing next to each other defending us. Mm. So overall, I would say it is true for sure that it is a more natural base of support in the Republican party, but especially in the legislature, um, we have we have a lot of good relationships with the Democratic lawmakers too. Yeah, it sounds like you're getting a lot of buy-in. I, I don't remember you saying, but uh, what year did this whole uh, nonprofit start? Uh, Nineteen eighty-nine. Did it start I when those people did. got arrested? Like, or short? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, they weren't personally arrested, but it started because of that. Mm. Right. So, in the eighties and nineties, there was a, a lawsuit in Texas called the Leaper case, where it was a class action suit to basically force the state to admit that homeschooling was legal as a type of private school because they were prosecuting all the homeschoolers as if they were truant. And 
uh, that went up to the Texas Supreme Court. They ruled unanimously in favor of homeschooling. And it was the core of people who helped push that case and push the kind of the political fight during that time are the people who started our organization. So Tim Lambert is our president, and he was around way back at the beginning, homeschooling his kids in the 80s when some people would have said it's illegal. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's I, I never that's some crazy history. Yeah. And I and dumb question, but y'all cover all of the United States, right? It's not just Texas. Well, so we coordinate with other groups outside of Texas. Our our individual focus is Texas, but we actually just went a couple of weeks ago to a national meeting with homeschool leaders from all of the different states. And so we coordinate with them, but um, you know, we don't we don't have, all of our laws, uh, all of our policies and uh, kind of member benefits that we offer and our conventions, like it's targeted towards Texas, but we get people sometimes from out of Texas who are interested. What are, are, are some of the, the key initiatives that, that y'all are working for in the next couple of years as a, as an organization? Yeah. So the very biggest one that we're working on in the, in the next legislative session is actually a, an amendment to the Texas constitution. So it's a parental rights amendment that would cover not just education, actually, it's broader than that to cover the right of parents to raise their kids, period. So, you know, education decisions, medical decisions, religious upbringing, all of those types of things. Um, but obviously that has a big overlap with homeschooling. And so that's, that's our biggest priority for the upcoming legislative session. That's great, Jeremy. Man, this has been a, a really intriguing conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got to be able to talk to you. Yeah, no, it's been great talking to you guys. I appreciate it. How can, uh, I know this sounds cliche, but, but what, uh, I imagine the way that people can really make an impact is to get out and vote. That is definitely the most immediate one, right? The election is right around the corner. And um, we, we have a list of endorsements on our website. So we do do candidate endorsements. If people wanted to go there, it's thsc.org slash endorsements is where they can find that list. And then obviously we have the legislative session starting in the spring. And so, uh, you know, it's hard to predict when and where right now, but I can tell people at some point we're going to need people to, you know, call legislators, maybe show up at hearings and we'll be posting all that information, but we always need people to do to help with that. Awesome, man. So uh, do y'all have a social media presence where people can follow? We do. Yep. Texas Homeschool Coalition. We're on Facebook and uh, Instagram. I don't think we're on a, on a, on TikTok. TikTok. I, guess we're on Twitter. <laughs> I guess we're on Twitter. I was going to say we're not on Twitter, but, but we're not on TikTok. We are on Twitter. I personally am off all of them now. I just hate them all. <laughs> it's too much. Um, I know a lot of people love them. Yeah. Well, Jeremy, I appreciate your time, man. And uh, I can't wait to put this one out. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Great talking to you guys. Thanks. Awesome. You have a good day. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye.